sorry, um, we are starting a bit, just some four or five minutes late. Um, but yes, we're going to start the meeting now. And you are all welcome for this um, health and adult social care scrutiny panel today. Um, and I just want to um, welcome all of you for this and the general public as well, if there is any at all here tonight. Please be advised, this meeting will be recorded and posted on the Council's YouTube channel. Can all those speaking ensure you switch on your microphone before addressing the meeting and remember to switch it off when you have finished speaking. Um, agenda number one, um, apologies for absence. Apologies have been received for Councillor Christine Councillor St. Matthew Daniel, Councillor Christine May, and Councillor Nick Williams. Um, do we have any other apologies? Yeah. P possible apologies for leaving early, Chair. Okay, thank you, um, Councillor Sarah Jane, for that, yeah. Agent business, that's um, agenda number two. There is no agent business. We go to agenda number three, declaration of interest. Does any member have any personal or financial interest to declare on any of the items on the agenda? I just want to say I work for the NHS, so in case I'm going too far, you just remember that um, I'm a staff, of, official staff of the NHS, and we're speaking about, um, <coughs> about health today. Agenda Number four, minutes. Members are requested to confirm as accurate record the minutes of meeting held on the 19th September 2024. Are members happy to agree the minutes of the last meeting? Yes, um, Councillor Matthew Morrow. Thank you, Chair. Further to um, what we were discussing before the meeting started. Um, I don't know if the meetings, if the minutes are entirely accurate, because it may well have been what it was said, um, but it is, it is not the case that um, items raised by members have been put on the work program and included in it. So um, when we were originally asked for items, I asked um, for the panel to look at the proportion of NHS spending that is spent on mental health, um, which I then raised again, and a third time, and I think this is now the fourth time I've raised it, and each time, um, I'm told that that will be incorporated into future meetings, but each, each time it is not. Um, so while it may be true that it has been, that that was said at the committee and that the minutes reflect what was said, it isn't true that it's been done. Yeah, thanks, um, Councillor Mark Morrow. Um, yes, I think you have mentioned what you just spoke about a number of times, and there were about uh, there were about four recommendations that we made. Three of them has been inculcated in this, our, our work program. Um, the last one, um, I spoke with the directors. They were going to get back to me about ICB to make a representation on that. And there is going to be um, a, a work program agenda on, I think that will be number, number eight. Is it eight? Yes, eight commissioning future reports. When we get to that, I will make a recommendation and then I think it will capture what you are talking about. Were you asking the question again? Um, Chair, I was going to suggest that uh, the panel agrees that we um, hold a meeting, that we add that to the agenda for the next meeting, um, irrespective of, of who else says what. Yeah, that's, that's what I was just saying. The, um, the Commission of Future Reports, when we get to that, we will definitely um, take that recommendation. Thank you. Uh, the, the true reflection, if that is the case, then we move to agenda item number five. Agenda item number five is mental health update. Oh, there's a question from... Yeah, sorry, Chair. Sorry to take us back. But um, I believe I gave an apologies for the meeting on the 19th. 
on the 19th? Yes, it's not noted here. We will, I'll review it and then Please. get the chair to approve it after. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, will, that will, be, will be corrected if it wasn't captured. So we are on agenda number five. Um, to receive presentation on mental health from the Director of Community Mental Health and Learning Disability Services at, at Oxley's. Um, you are most welcome. This will be presented by Lauren Reagan, um, Director for Community Mental Health and Learning Disability Services. If we, if you spend five minutes to uh, brief us about it, um, um, our honorable members of the panel will have the opportunity to ask you questions. So you, go, you can go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Um, as Chair said, my name is Lorraine Regan. I'm the Director for Community Mental Health and Learning Disabilities and um, have brought an operational um, update from Oxley's around adult mental health. Hopefully, you've all had a chance to read the presentation in the pack, and we agreed that I would just do a high-level summary for five minutes um, to allow you maximum time for questions. Um, so you'll see from the pack that we've described the range of services that are provided by Oxley's. Um, we've given a broad indication of our budget, so our spend on mental health, um, and talked about the National Programme for Community Mental Health Transformation. That's been the framework for which we've developed services over the last three years. Um, and for us locally, there's been a strong focus on developing our mental health hub, which is in Plumstead, co-located with Plumstead Health Centre, and ensuring that we have mental health practitioners across all of the primary care networks in Greenwich. Um, I think probably some of the transformation that we had hoped for has been a little bit limited by the increase in demand. So services have seen an 80% increase in demand since 2019. That's a really significant um, increase and so has probably limited the extent to which we've been able to really transform services, but has certainly enabled us to um, meet that demand. Um, those models of care required us to integrate with our uh, voluntary sector providers. We've done that well in Greenwich. We work really closely with MIND and with Bridge Support to deliver the services out of the hub. Um, and that allows us to not only focus on clinical support, but also on the social determinants of health, which obviously have a huge impact when we're talking about mental health. Um, we know that some of the significant health inequalities that people face are focused around their physical health. You'll see a slide in the pack that outlines um, a new service that we were able to stand up that focuses purely on people's physical health. Um, and that's had a really good impact in terms of increasing the uptake of physical health checks, but also ensuring that when there are issues identified as part of those checks, we are acting on them. Um, and I think a really positive um, story for us, which is different to the rest of London, is that that work that we've been doing in the community has had a positive impact on people attending ED. So when we look at the data for people presenting at the emergency department, a significant proportion are unknown, and the people that are known to us, we are managing largely to keep away. Um, that's almost reversed in many other parts of London where they're seeing a significant proportion of patients that are known to services present to ED. So that's seen as positive. We are still challenged when it comes to managing our bed base um, and we are using some private sector beds but that has um, reduced hugely in the last couple of years due to a, a focused piece of work both in the community and in our crisis pathways um, and we are also looking at our inequalities data to determine whether or not we've got particular pockets of the population that are overrepresented um, in those services and that's work that perhaps um, at some future point it might be good for us to come back and present on its quite early days at the moment. So I think that's probably my five minutes up 
um, but happy to take questions. Thanks, um, Lorraine, for that submission. Um, I now ask panel members if you have any question. I start with um, Councillor Sarah. Yeah, Merrill, yeah. Thank you for that. In the um, table on page 19, um, you do acknowledge, well, you, you, I wouldn't know, but you, you say you acknowledge that um, patients would like and need more frequent contact, and we do not always meet our own standards around required contact for red and amber zone patients. Um, it, is there any way you can elaborate on that and talk us through that a bit? Because as a layperson, I would have thought that with red and amber zone patients, if they expect and need direct contact and they're not getting it, that's a bit of a danger zone. So thank you. Yeah, Sorry. so um, every patient that is zoned will have an individual plan in terms of how frequently they should be contacted. Um, and I think we recognize that um, there are times when demand is such that we physically, with the capacity that we've got, can't meet that um, target. I think there's some slides in there around care team approach, and that has been our solution to that problem in many ways. And we are now starting to see data that suggests we're much more aligned to those target times. So we've added in additional staff with the specific aim of increasing contact to those people that are particularly red zone patients. And the current um, and emerging data suggests that we are now pretty much on target. Um, but that was certainly has been a concern because you're right. Um, it would, it, you know, it, it presents a risk if we're not seeing people um, as frequently as we feel they should be seen. Thank you, Chair. Well, well, you can ask, yeah. It's only a very quick supplementary. So you said you, you've taken on more staff. Sorry, I, I just wanted, so, so you have. So there's been recruitment. You've got additional staff. Now. Thank you. Thanks um, for, for that question. Any other person? Yes, um, I'll start with Councillor Mark Morrow. Thank you, Chair. Um, so you mentioned a, an increase in demand for services. Could you give us an indication of um, how much the increase in demand is? What, what, are, what are people's situations? What are they asking you for help with? Um, so in terms of front door activity, it's about 80% since 2019. And that has been hugely impacted by everything that's happened in the country since 2019, really. So um, a huge increase in demand around, during and after COVID, um, which I think was to be expected, but the percentage increase was much higher than a lot of the trajectories had suggested it would be when we were at the early days of COVID and some of those trajectories were established. We've then had cost of living crisis, you know, all of the kind of economic issues, Ukraine, um, and they all have a significant impact on people's mental health. And so um, it has been pretty unprecedented, that rise in demand, um, but almost, not all of it, but a huge proportion of it is linked to social determinants, to those environmental factors. Thank you. Another question? You want to go ahead? All right, good. Supplementary, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so, if I may, I'd like to read you a really short quote from um, Lord Darcy's report into the NHS. Um, so, um, I don't know if he's watching. I assume he always watches the, um, the health scrutiny panel in, in Greenwich for, for tips. But um, so he says, there is a fundamental problem in the distribution of resources between uh, mental health and physical health. Mental health accounts for more than 20% of the burden of disease, but less than 10% of NHS expenditure. This is not new, but the combination of chronic underspending and low productivity results in a treatment gap that affects nearly every family in the communities across the country. By, by low productivity, um, he's referring to uh, 
uh, uh, things like buildings and systems being um, inadequate. He's not suggesting that staff aren't working very hard, which they most certainly are, and he's talking about investment in buildings so that staff can do the jobs they're trained for. So just in case anyone misunderstanding what he's saying there, but do, um, do you agree with him that the, the burden of disease is, is much higher than the proportion of spending? I think we wouldn't argue that the burden of disease is definitely high. I think it's the proportion of vending. I think we would all argue that more money would be beneficial into mental health services. We have seen quite a significant investment in the last three years, so about six million pounds into our mental health services um, locally. Is it enough? Probably not. Um, when we sit with system partners, everybody, you know, I think there's a, there's a huge demand on all services. Um, but if I was advocating for the services that I manage, I would always be arguing for more. Um, there's definitely more we could do if the resources were available. How realistic it is in the current climate is a question that's beyond my pay grade. Um, but, yeah. Thank you. The, uh, the people whose pay grade it is are um, mysteriously absent. Um, people always advocate for the service that, that they provide, but, and of course they would. You know, someone who's a, an ear specialist is really interested in that and is going to advocate for their service. So I, I do take that point. Um, but the actual the proportion um, spent on mental health in, by this ICB has gone down again this year, as it has in previous years. Was that a comment, or you wanted her to comment on it? Sorry, Chair. Um, um, as Reagan quite rightly mentioned, an investment. I thought it would be important to say that investments take place in the context of the entire budget. So the, I can give you the, the, the figures are now um, in an ICB report, which is, is certainly an improvement, because previously um, they were hard to find. But the... ICB reports that in 2022-23, the proportion of the total spend that went to mental health was 10.95%, whereas in 23-24, it's fallen to 10.71%. I appreciate points of percentage might not sound that much, but given that the overall spend is 4.1 billion, the actual amount of difference there is, if, if they'd spent the same proportion this year as last year, there would be 9.8 million pounds more for mental health, which is, yeah. seems an unusual, a, 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 it seems like a, a, it, it's not for you to respond to that, but it, it's a difficult decision, to, it, to me it seems like a difficult decision to justify, given that Lord Darcy is saying that the burden of health is 20% mental, the burden of disease is 20% mental health, but the spending is, is half of that. It seems like he's identifying um, that as a, a major issue. Um, that's a very fair comment. Uh, I'll move swiftly to um, Councillor Adegbemi. <laughs> Adegbemi, um, thank you very much for the presentation. I'm very interested reading it. Um, I was quite shocked to hear that we've had 80% increase. Um, that's extremely high. And um, two key things that I'm interested in getting to know. Um, you've already mentioned that possibly we may have a presentation where we interrogate data. Because um, one of the key things that we recognize is the fact that there's health inequality um, which is really, really massive. There are communities that are prone to, there are communities that you can predict that you have higher number of people who will have mental ill health, and it's about early intervention. So perhaps not now, um, but Chair, please let us know, or uh, maybe some of that we'll consider when we're thinking of topics to, to, um, to bring um, to the panel, is just looking at how are we using data in predicting because I believe, you know, that in that adage very seriously, that prevention is better than cure. So we know that when a person has those determinant factors that you mentioned, that you briefly mentioned earlier, there's a likelihood that this and this would happen. So that's the first question. How are we using data? Or how do we intend to use data to do what I call upstream prevention? That's the first one. The second one is around demography. 
um, this is really important and still very much linked to early intervention. Um, we need to know the breakdown of those 80%. We need to know where they're coming from, which side of the borough are they coming from? Are there areas where we need to put a lot more services into? Are there areas where we need to, let's just see what we can do to make sure that the numbers are reduced and the 80% comes down. That's really important. And the last question or question or comment is around young people. We've got three universities in this borough. And we know that, um, I'm sure you would have the data, that a lot of young people are experiencing mental ill health at the moment, especially in universities. So it would be great to know what links we have to Ravens, Ravensbourne University. I think we have Covent, in fact, there are four. We, I think we have a, um, a Coventry, we have um, Kent, and we have Royal Borough of Greenwich. I think there are four universities in this borough. So it would be great to know what links do we have working with the universities. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in terms of the inequalities, we have got much better data relatively recently than we used to have, which is beginning, so it's population health data, which is beginning to help us to kind of see how our data maps onto borough data. Um, so, for example, we've had a real uh, push to make sure that every, uh, every clinical contact, we're checking that we've got people's ethnicity and other protected characteristics recorded, because in order for us to have some reliable efforts at kind of working out what, what we need to target, we need that baseline data. And I think currently in Greenwich, our ethnicity data is now at something like 94%, so we're very nearly there. Um, it's been harder work than you might imagine, kind of making that happen. Um, we are really trying to encourage our primary care colleagues to send us that at the point of referral so that it doesn't take time away from our initial kind of contacts, but that's probably work in progress. Um, but what we're now able to do is look at that against the primary care network data to see whether or not we're seeing an over-representation of people in our services from a particular PCN. Um, and that's going to allow us to use our mental health practitioners in a more needs-focused way, which is what we think um, is, the, you know, is the right thing for them to be doing. Um, so it is still relatively early. But, and and the, the kind of overall aim of that really is to close the mortality gap because we know that despite all of the work over the last two decades, people with serious mental illness still die earlier than their peers that don't have an SMI. So ultimately, we want to try and close that gap, and we need to target the right groups of people to do that. Um, I think in relation to the point about universities, um, Time to Talk, which is our talking therapies uh, service, have really good links with those higher education institutes. Um, in secondary care, our work is often split across shared care with other trusts and other agencies because quite often people remain in their home borough um, for long-term care. Um, and so we often have to do joint work with other teams. And we've got some really good examples of that in our early intervention in psychosis team where they've done some really nice creative work with other organisations to join up people's care. If somebody with psychosis goes home for a long summer break, they can't just be left without support. So it is, it's the, you know, they are good examples of joint working across different systems and often in you know, far-flung parts of the country. Um, but I think you're right, the proportion of people that we're seeing in that age group has definitely grown and some of that demand is attributable to that cohort of people that are in that age bracket. Thanks. Any further questions from anybody? Yes, um, Councillor Tester. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thanks very much for your report. Um, I, I, I just wanted to um, ask a couple of questions. Uh, this is on page 11, uh, the ADAPT, um, and the, the vision that you have for um, improving that service. 
Um, so uh, item five, uh, we should see over time a reduction in the activity ADP based on this model in the hubs being op optimized. And this will allow us to right size this pathway. Could you give us a sort of sense of what kind of time scale that would be over? Um, and similarly to that, the uh, item four, cl clinicians will focus on treatment optimization and improve patient outcomes. Um, it, if that's already started, how is that going? Is there any improvement? Thanks. So um, our um, ADAPT team, so that's anxiety, depression, personality disorder and trauma, um, has always been um, a big team, which is almost a catch-all team for people that kind of don't necessarily fit anywhere else um, and has huge levels of demand. When we set up the hubs, we wanted, so pr prior to the hubs, we had something called Primary Care Plus, and that was really just a triage service. So it was a, it was a front door, but it would tele-triage patients and then send them to the relevant team. Um, and when the hubs were established, what we wanted to do was provide an immediate and brief interventions in that service. And those interventions typically are group programs around things like managing emotions, um, supporting people with some of those social kind of issues, um, and having some brief psychological therapy. And that fits best with our um, ADAPT model. So by kind of natural consequence, you hope that if you intervene really early with that group of people and you offer them something that's fairly immediate, rather than them have to go to wait in a more specialist team, that it will reduce the number of people that flow through to that more specialist team. And we are seeing that now already. So we've got some data that shows that that is, is working. Um, we know that our other main pathway, which is around psychosis, won't have that impact won't be the same because typically people with psychosis need a secondary care offer because they typically need medication, which can be quite complicated to establish and kind of manage. Um, so this is the pathway where we think um, there is the most opportunity to change people's experience and provide something much more quickly. Um, and the data is good and requires there not to be too much more of a spike in um, demand in order for us to continue to improve on that. Um, and the clinicians focusing on treatment optimization, I think, is because over time, where pathways get so, um, demand is so high, people lose sight of the, their purpose and what you know, they're there to achieve. And what we tried to do was really refocus clinical time, particularly the expensive clinical time that we put into those teams on what's the plan, this is the treatment, deliver the treatment, remove some of the noise from around that that kind of sucked in clinical time into projects and programs of work that are valuable but they're not getting the kind of job done. Um, and again, I think people actually have responded really well to that. People like certainty, they like to know that they've got a clear plan for their job. And so I think we expected um, a little bit of pushback around that, but actually people have been really positive and found it quite helpful to have a job plan that is very specific um, and almost frees them up from worrying about some of the other stuff. Thank you, um, Lauren, for the answers. Um, do we have any other further questions? Um, otherwise, I will um, say, well done, thank you very much. But then I want to just um, um, <coughs> possibly find out about this as well. Um, you spoke initially about 70% of demand um, has increased, uh, up to 70%, and, and that of the, the, the front um, door is almost 80% because of COVID. I also do understand, I mean, I read a book which speaks about no, call nobody normal because there are so many things that can make us, uh, lead us to mental breakdown. Even um, housing can be a problem. People are having terrible, they are finding it difficult to pay their bills. That is a major cause. Relationships within families, even work, pressures within work, and all these. 
if you were to look at all these courses and that of um, those who have, um, let's say, um, organic courses, for instance, is it a case where because we have an increase of people who have come to the borough that has helped to increase the demand this way, or is it because of um, specific areas, and which are the two, three major ones that um, are the main causes of this increase, and how are you dealing with it? That's the first question. The, the second question is also about um, a very fantastic report, I will say, but then um, most of the time, if it is linked with some evidence of how these things are done, um, that will be very helpful, um, let's say, in future um, um, reports. And I will also want to um, just speak about health and inequalities, for instance. I think that has been mentioned, but um, how are we dealing with that? Are we making any progress at all? If you can comment on this, please. Thank you. Um, so I think probably the two things that we see in terms of those social determinant, bearing in mind we do see the full range and it's hard to quantify each of them, but I think um, anecdotally, um, because I don't have the, the data here, um, the things that cause our teams the most concern are housing and drug and alcohol issues. So they're the two things that probably they're dealing with most regularly. Um, it's possibly that those things are the most tricky to deal with. So it's not to say that there aren't equal numbers of people perhaps with debt and relationship issues because they are also very common. They're probably slightly more straightforward for a clinician to work through with somebody than the drug and alcohol and the housing issues. So I'd say they're probably the top to um, in terms of the uh, inequalities I think you did ask something else before inequalities and I can't remember what it was yeah yeah I mean certainly we can give some um, examples around that evidence um, when we next present um, and the inequalities I think there is definitely progress but it's an area that there's so much more we need to do in we're definitely not at a point where um, we can probably celebrate just yet because it's, it's really early days. I think you've heard from Time to Talk before and they do some really great work in terms of engaging faith groups and looking at very specific populations that they know through their data are underrepresented in um, talking therapy services. Um, We've also done some work to think about whether we continue to see an over-representation of young black men in crisis services, um, and we do. And there isn't a corresponding um, over-representation in our community services, so there's something about um, how we target support to that group of people in the community to prevent them tipping into crisis because they're going into those crisis teams, ED, um, and home treatment teams without coming to the attention of community services first. So we have um, some work going on to think about how we can encourage those groups into our sort of first step services before they hit those crisis services. But um, again, we could probably do a whole um, session on inequalities at some point if you wanted to put that in a future program. The inequality will be something that will be exciting to have further um, information about. I believe a member has mentioned that already as well, so we can note that as well. Um, in the, yes. I just have a suggestion about the reports. Um, we're not all um, in the health industry, so a lot of um, jargon, acronyms have been used. Um, I don't know the meaning of ICM, for example, Section 75, SCL. The good thing is some of the acronyms, um, they were the meaning for some, and some, the meaning wasn't given. So it would just be good, at least the first, men the first use of the acronym, if that could um, just the, the That's could be broken really, up. That's yeah. a really good reminder. We're very bad at acronyms <laughs> in the NHS. So, um, 
thank you. Yeah, that's a very, very important point, and I think, Sarah, you were also speaking about it. Um, but yes, um, a lot of us are not um, medical, or we, 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 we don't understand the abbreviation, so it's best to, even though um, you can have the, you know, the table of abbreviation to interpret, but then it doesn't help in concentration when you have to be going up and down to be checking. So where you have to write the full thing, it will be very helpful. Yes. Thank you, Chair. I was just going to emphasize that. We did talk about that before. Um, so um, it, it, it was said by my colleague that, you know, written out the first time, but actually I would argue against that. I can't keep referring back every time. I just prefer the full name to be written every single time. And when someone's giving a presentation as well, to just say what it is rather than ACM or D DMT or because it's really, really wearing. It, it just, it's, it, 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 the sentence is meaningless. Thank you. Thanks, um, Sarah, for emphasizing on that as well, yes. So thank you very much um, for answering the questions, making your presentation and answering the questions. Um, I will move swiftly to item six. So thank you, you can move and then um, item six is integrated commissioning update. Um, to consider the report integrated commissioning update and make recommendations to the executive if necessary this will be presented by Lisa Wilson, Integrated Director of Commissioning. Um, so that will be great to hear from Lisa, and thanks for coming. You have also five minutes to make your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you for welcoming me. So I'm Lisa Wilson, Integrated Director of Commissioning for Adults in Greenwich, so I'm here to present to you today. And Chair, I've tried to build into the slides that I'm just going to run through very briefly some of the questions that you had for us in advance as well, and there's some data in there that might mean I go slightly over the five minutes, but it might help um, in terms of some of the workforce questions that you had. Is that okay yeah, with everybody? Okay, thank you. So in terms of... Um, the context, um, you've got this in the report already, but in terms of the um, purpose of the report, it's to provide an update on our commissioning arrangements and those uh, specifically in relation to integrated commissioning. And then also to provide an update on the quality and the quantity of the care that we have um, in our communities and on um, continuing health care, which also comes under my responsibility in Greenwich. So I think um, well-made points about the um, definitions, and we've tried to provide some of that in the report to support that understanding. So when I came into my role in 2022, there had already been an agreement between the local authority and the NHS locally to make sure that we could have an arrangement legally for us to have an integrated approach to commissioning. That is known as a Section 75 agreement, and that gives us the power across local authorities and the NHS to commission on each other's behalf. That's really positive for local residents because it means that we're trying to join up around a person and not separate what we're doing in the system around our own organisational um, place in that system as being the first priority. We've also set out what commissioning is. I think in times um, people haven't understood that in the last few years and also the shift of what commissioning might have been in the past versus what we're de deeming it to be today. And some of that changed in uh, 2022 when the Health and Care Act came in and then integrated care boards were formed, and then that's um, some of the shift that we've seen since. So in the context of um, where we are in Greenwich, it really is about working with residents and using our data and identifying what those real needs are of our local people and their wishes, and then understanding how we can work with partners, including the voluntary sector and other local organisations and the NHS to meet those needs. And again, in the context of integrated commissioning, we do that together. In the next slide, I've just given a really headline figure, and I think we talked a lot about resources earlier on. It's really important to understand the way those resources come in. So we get some from national level into the local integrated care board at South East London level, and then we get a proportion of those to meet Greenwich needs. If I look at the total of the responsibilities to commission care and support for NHS and local government in Greenwich, and this excludes staffing budgets and the in-house provisions that we have, as part of our local authority provision, that amounts to around 300 million pounds. So it's significant in terms of our way of influencing how that money is spent. Um, 
If you then move on into the next slide, we, um, we've taken a bit of a journey over the last couple of years because we wanted to make sure that we had a joined up health and wellbeing strategy that aligned to our missions in our Greenwich, really important that we had that golden thread. And then we had NHS requirements to have a five year forward view and annual plans against that five years. So we've tried to do that in a consolidated way rather than having all these different plans that talk about different NHS or local government priorities, bringing that together, um, really important to tell that story. What we then did was look at, in a commissioning context, what we needed to commission and how we would like... Sorry. Well, I mean, there's so much information on these slides, they're meaningless. I can't get, I can't deduce anything from these slides at all. They're just like a page from a textbook. I mean, they're, they're also illegible, but what was on the previous slide was just absolutely crammed. It wasn't a graphic at all. I, I mentioned earlier on, and I appreciate that, what I was going to do was try and touch on things that were already in the report. So this was um, to enhance that. And I spoke to the chair about sending these slides to you so that you can read them. I'm not going to go through the detail on the slides because absolutely it's too much for you to see, but I wanted to share so with you, you the story. So you're summarising it? Is that I'm summarising what was in the report, but in the slides, yeah, but okay. that's really helpful feedback, thank you. So this is just some of the context, I'm not gonna go through it, but it was for you to understand the journey that we went on in understanding what staff and residents said could work differently in integrated commissioning. And then the vision that I set out in the report is in the next slide. So again, I won't go into detail because it was in there. Essentially, what we were saying was commissioning was moving from being about just buying services to being much more transformational about how we work with partners, address inequalities, and deliver the right services for our residents. And the principles that we've got on this slide on the left, again, I've written these in full in the report, but it was about making sure that we think about partnerships, that we think about outcomes, we think about really co-producing and engaging with our residents in different ways and that we support our workforce to develop their skills and their ability to address those inequalities for impact for our local residents. I'm going to skip over the next one and just skip to slide 10 because that really talks about the health and wellbeing strategy. What I've touched on in the report is some of the things that we do under those headings. So particularly for my team, it's really important that we um, support people to stay well in the community to be well in the community, and we work with our partners to do that, um, including primary care. But a couple of really important areas of focus around the feel well and the age well aspects of what we do. Feel, feel well, as it is written in the main report, is about people um, having the best lives they can with mental health needs and other disabilities, and then aging well, so supporting people as they age. And that isn't an age boundary thing, but as people age, and they might have um, more significant needs. The chair asked me to touch on a couple of examples where we've done some things over the last couple of years. So I've got those on the next slide. So you might be familiar with our joint carer strategy in Greenwich. So that was a piece of work that my team and our partners did and our operational colleagues to look at what our carers in the borough were saying that were important to them in terms of the support they needed. We then had an action plan underneath that and that supports us then to think about those commissioning decisions and the services that we put in place. So things like the Carers Centre in Greenwich, that relationship and the contract with that organisation is something that my team work in partnership with and when we also have the Carers Partnership Board. So carers and our residents um, as part of that um, and organisations working with us. Assistive technology enabled care was the other example, so it's something that um, is coming forward and a service going live in next year. That's really important for our residents to have a modernised service, so often people feed back to us in our work that we don't give them the sorts of experiences with digital solutions that they receive in their day-to-day -day lives. So we've been working with our digital team and our health colleagues to um, design that, but really, really closely with residents. They've been in those design groups all the way through that work. And then touching on feel well, we've been working really closely with lots of local residents around what they believe good mental health services need to look like in Greenwich. So it's an extract here on the slide, but we've got that report um, and it's due to be um, launched this year. And we've engaged with staff and residents and they've said to us the, the key things for them are about compassionate services and really understanding what matters to them. And to Lorraine's point, talking about the different things that they need, not just the things today, so I know Lorraine talked about some of the transformational work in Oxleys, but this mental health vision goes beyond that in terms of what people want from 
primary care from prevention services commissioned by public health or some of those wider things that are in the community. And I think needs assessment was talked about earlier on. Really, really importantly, we're working with public health colleagues to do a specific needs assessment for mental health population needs in the borough. Again, taking into account the resident views about that and all the population level data and looking at where those inequalities are now so that we can then uh, match that to what people's needs are and work with the likes of Oxley's colleagues to meet those in different ways and get to the communities that are not being represented in our services at the moment. Turning to continuing healthcare, I put in the report, again, some uh, information about that um, for the borough. Um, I won't touch on that too much in these slides because it was in the report, but what I would say is our performance and these performance reports are available um, to share with you. Now our, our rate of assessing people for continuing health care has consistently been at 100% on the 28-day metric. That's how NHS England assess us in terms of the rate at which we meet people's needs. So I'm really proud of that because the team have worked really hard to have that improvement journey over the last few years. We've also outlined in the report the sorts of services that people get. And turning to quality and quantity of services, I've outlined those in the report, so you will have seen those already. If you go to um, slide 17, Marion, next one, and the next one. Um, I'm not going to go through this because it was in the report. Again, these are slides that I want to share with you afterwards as well, so that you can see them visually in terms of some of the graphs. But largely people are accessing good quality services in the borough for mental health we've got some um, specific work we do with those providers that my quality assurance team work with it's very much a supportive approach with providers because if we notice things and the cqc notice things we want them to be the best that they can be so we do some of that hand holding if we move to learning disabilities which is the next slide again some graphs in here and the stats were in the report as well but we see that most people are supported by good quality provision and where we need to work with CQC around um, things that aren't as good as they could be. That quality assurance team really work um, hand in hand with those providers. We know that we need to do some more work around supported living and as I outlined in the report, we're doing that over the next couple of years for those with learning disabilities. We have a mixture of in-house services and also those um, out in the community and we want to make sure that we have those partnerships as strong as we can. And then in terms of ageing well, so things like home care, um, as I said, ageing well isn't an age boundary thing, it's about people having the right support in the community. So we've recommissioned that um, home care model over the last few years and we're starting to see um, some of the workforce um, things coming through as a more positive aspect from some of those relationships. And when you look at the proportion of people supported either through our spot contracted or our framework contracted providers, the proportion of people who are accessing good quality care um, has been increasing. There's some technicalities around where a CQC registration happens, um, but, but broadly speaking, that's where uh, we see people uh, in good quality provision. In terms of market sustainability and quality, I've outlined in the report some factors, but we've seen um, trends over the last few years that aren't dissimilar to previous years. And in terms of the factors on the next slide that we talked to, very much about how we work with providers in partnership to understand their pressures. You'll all know that the government previously said they were going to reform social care and some more money would come into local government to support pay rates to go up and in turn support the workforce to receive more in their day-to-day -day wages than we could have afforded before. We've managed to do some of that, but not all of it, and we wait um, more news about the settlements um, from this autumn statement. I think, Mariam, you can skip forward to the next one on 23. So uh, there's a lot of data on this slide, but I've produced this so that you can read it afterwards because it was a specific question from the chair that I only got on Monday about workforce data. But just to give you some statistics that I think might be useful in terms of understanding where we benchmark. In um, Greenwich, if you look at our vacancy rates, we're actually um, performing much better than some areas of the country. So we have 8% as our vacancy rate, which is lower than national and regional. In terms of Greenwich, in terms of our um, diversity of our workforce as well, um, when you look at those statistics, nationally 80% plus of the workforce in care are from British um, backgrounds. And in Greenwich, we have 42% of non-EU and workforce and 6% of EU. So I'm really interested in that because we need to make sure that the workforce 
are aligned to the needs of the population and the characteristics and the diversity of that. That statistic for me shows that we're moving in the right direction with that. But equally, we know with some sponsorship arrangements and some things that the Home Office have put in place, we need to make sure that our care workforce have got the right support and the right pay. If you then look at the pay rates, which I've put on here as well, um, it's really interesting when you look at those in a bit more detail because you can see that actually in Greenwich, some of our um, more senior workforce in the care market are receiving slightly more um, than what um, other areas are and they're definitely receiving more than the national living wage. We also pay London living wage for a number of our contracts in Greenwich. So we're moving towards a better position of what uh, the care workforce are paid, which I think was one of the chair's specific questions that I had on Monday. Um, I'm gonna stop there with the, the um, presentation because um, to your point is detail, and I wanna make sure that we share it with you afterwards. But I also took those questions from the chair on Monday and tried to make sure that we um, had some information available in addition to the report and the detail that was in there that was obviously published for you as well. Thank you, um, thank you, Lisa, for that um, report. Um, questions, I start with, yes, go ahead. Thank you, Chair, thank you, Lisa, for the presentation. I'm just going to second what um, Councillor Sarah said earlier. And that presentation didn't look like it was a presentation, it looked like a report. It would have been nice if they were bulleted, um, summarized, and were able to read through. I know you said you suggested to chair that, um, you know, maybe to send to us so that we can read through. But even if you'd send it to us, that's not a presentation, that's a report. Um, too heavy, not something that we can just look through and pick up, you know, the content points from there. But well, thank you very much for the information, very useful. Three areas I'm very concerned about, and I'm glad you mentioned the workforce. And I'm looking at page, um, well, it's page 64 on this report here. I don't know whether, what page it will be on yours. This is under supported living. I live in Thamesmead, and I'm glad this report mentioned it because if it didn't, I was intending to bring it up. There is a proliferation. Yeah particularly in Thamesmead, and it is really worrying. I live in an exclusive residential area, and I know that there have been about three planning applications that have gone into town homes in strictly residential areas into supported living, and it is extremely inappropriate. So there's an element that I believe um, we need to be working with planning on. In fact, my next door neighbor, when she was moving out, applied, and almost everybody on the street said no, you're going to change the dynamics of the street. I don't know why particularly Thames, I kind of have an idea why, to be honest, and let me say I don't know why, but this is something that I believe we need to look into. It's, it's very um, unhealthy for a community that is meant to be residential. That's the first thing. The second thing is around contract monitoring. You didn't mention that in the report, and it would be great to know how, what kind of cycle do you have with contract monitoring? for the contracts that you have with the supported living, learning disability schemes and all of that. What, um, what, um, which um, schemes do you have that have been put on measures? What have you done with them to make sure that corrective actions have been put in place? That's the second thing. The third thing, and that's the one you've mentioned, I like the fact that you mentioned, which is on the workforce. Um, at the last, um, the penultimate labor conference, I remember supporting emotion. I actually did raise there the concerns around people who have come into the country to fill the massive vacancy we have in, uh, in um, health and social care on certificate of sponsorship. I know from casework about the abuse that a lot of these sponsors meet out to their staff. It is extremely ridiculous. Do we have anything, any process, any policy to, I know it's the home office, there's an element for the home office, but however, this site can be captured under contract monitoring around workforce. So if we have anything I'd like to know. Sorry, I've asked too many questions, but. <laughs> Go ahead, Lisa, you can answer that. Thank you. So, um, workforce, absolutely. We wouldn't have uh, a set of uh, care providers in, in our community without the workforce. That's what makes up um, how we support people. Um, 
To your point about supported living, we are also concerned about that. So one of the things that my quality assurance team do is if a provider sets up in the borough and they try and register with CQC or we hear about them through planning, as an example, my team will do what's called a new to market visit. And that would be to go and um, have that conversation if they've already set up. And sometimes we don't always find out because some provisions don't need to be CQC registered so we don't get the alerts. But from a planning perspective, we are building much closer relationships with housing to be on the front foot. So part of our changed relationship with our colleagues about commissioning is about that collaboration across the local authority. So I work very closely with our housing colleagues now to make sure we're preemptive about that. The other thing about um, supported living is that there's um, a movement between different boroughs of, of where people are placed, and we don't always place within our own borough because sometimes people have choice about where they're placed, but also about capacity. And equally, you get that the other way around. So we're working really closely with those other boroughs about some of those arrangements as well. And my intention is to make sure that we recommission supported living in a way that reduces the risk of the sorts of things that you're talking about here, because it's really important. And people often say to us, we don't want to be segre segregated. We actually want our own front door in a home in a community that matters to us with access to local resources. So that's really important from a planning perspective because otherwise we might end up with these sorts of settings in areas of the borough where people are disconnected from communities. And actually for their health and well-being, it's really important to be connected and not the opposite. So really important point. Um, and the, the sorts of policies and procedures we're putting in place are to safeguard against the sorts of things that you're talking about here. Contract monitoring, again, really absolutely important. So my team don't only, only commission these services, they hold the relationships once those are in place and do the contract management, management, sorry, and the monitoring. So we have officers that deal with the strategic and operational relationships with those um, providers, but then I mentioned those quality assurance officers. They have a cycle of quality assurance for these provisions and they go in and they ask for evidence. So they ask for wage slips, they ask for um, documents of policy and, uh, policies and procedures. We have whole workbooks that they go through and they ask these providers to give them evidence of the quality and the sustainability of what they're doing. And if they notice irregularities, we then work with our safeguarding co colleagues and we make an assessment as to whether those providers should be put into something called a provider quality concerns procedure. And when I said hand-holding, what we do is we understand the evidence, we put those action plans in place, and we assure ourselves through partnership meetings with safeguarding and my quality assurance teams and other relevant partners that those actions are being taken. And if we're then not assured of that quality, we do take steps to decommission services because we're not content with that. So the contract management and the quality assurance go hand in hand. And we also use different software to look at the sustainability of providers. So we look at their company structures, we look at where their profit margins are, we look at where um, the income and expenditure um, might give us some concerns. And those indicators also give us reason to go in and ask questions. And I've had, since I've been here, I've had very challenging conversations with providers when we've looked at the structure of their businesses and said, actually, this doesn't meet the requirements of what we're looking for in Greenwich. We wouldn't really want to work with you as a partner. And what we're trying to do is invest in those local relationships and, and develop provision in the borough for our residents so that we stop some of the unintended consequences of some of the private investment you've seen in social care. It's not to say private companies and independent organisations aren't good. They can be really good but the partnership and the quality and the sustainability have to go hand in hand. So I'm really assured that actually our processes in Greenwich will spot these things, and we have day-to-day -day things that come across my radar that give me that confidence. We brief our lead member around that, and we make sure that we're um, working as hard as we can to safeguard our residents um, through those processes. The Home Office work then links to that, because through our quality assurance processes, we've spotted things We've then got partnerships with the police locally and our safeguarding colleagues. And there's been very recent instances where we've gone in and we've had to support people through partnership with the Salvation Army, where some people have been found to be brought into the country under sponsorship licenses, which contravene the Home Office rules. And we will then put that wraparound support in place. There's been some investment at South East London level to then put a wider wraparound support so that people, if they truly are here with the right sponsorship, can then be supported into where there's vacancies in the right sort of providers for them. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Lisa. Um, Councillor Sarah Jemiro, go, go ahead. Um, so thank you, Lisa. Those answers were um, put some put some meat, I guess, on the on, on the report. Um, what, I, like, I appreciate, you know, I came over as grumpy and will continue to do so. What I found very frustrating about the report was that it's very high level aspirational stuff. I mean, there is, like you had alluded to when you went through it, there's some material in there about the living wage and, the, you know, the pay of carers, and that's some, some substance. But most of it is very high level aspirational, and so much so that I actually I read it twice, and I, I came away with nothing. The whole, the whole report, really, I couldn't come away. If somebody would said, name me six things, it says, I couldn't really do so. I mean, I'm not going to rub it in, but I mean, I appreciate this graphic is designed to be high level, and I understand that. But I mean, it says our health and well-being strategy takes a life course approach with a focus on enabling our residents to live well and experience their best lives. Well, like we don't expect them to live terribly and experience terrible lives, do we? And it says start well, be well, feel well. And then it just, it, it states the obvious. And there's Obviously, it's, it, there's more flowery language around that, but you know, I did ask colleagues before whether they agreed with me, and they did. And I found it very, very frustrating. And I won't go into sort of ridicule and pull out other examples, so I, I could. But um, so your answers were, were, you know, like fine, and I actually gleaned something. But I do feel like some. Um, evidence, some examples, some clarification, and just some plain English, actually, um, w w would have been of, of, of far more value. Um, so I am being a bit grumpy, and I know that you have, and your team, and the ex extensive teams under you have a lot of work to do, and, you know, it must have put, taken time to put such a report together. But for my part, and I... I, I don't know if my colleagues will agree with me, I would have preferred something much simpler just with examples so that I could have taken away with it actually what was going on um, and, and not the report. So thank you. Thanks, um, Sarah, for your comment. I don't think that was a question. That was a comment, wasn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm yeah. happy. To yeah, no, it's yeah. fine. I guess it was a question. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to respond. <laughs> I think when we looked at the brief of what the panel wanted, it was an update on integrated commissioning, and there's been a three-year uh, journey. So I think it was quite difficult to then say, how do you give kind of detailed data or specific examples without showing some of that journey? And I appreciate the strategic nature of it is unhelpful in some ways. I was trying to show the story. That graphic is from our health and wellbeing strategy. So that guides what we do in the borough to meet um, our population needs. But I really take into account the feedback. Thank you. Yes, um, <coughs> Mariam. Um, and just, I think probably just to add into that as well, um, I think one of the things that we were trying to do was show you, again, I think as, as Lisa says, the actual report that was commissioned was around what, what are our integrated commissioning arrangements. So I think it is, to, to your point, somewhat a top like higher level report in some regards. Um, from the original commission, plus the, including the life cycle or the life course piece was allowing you, I think, to kind of ground it in what the health and wellbeing strategy is doing as well, so that you could see potentially the different kind of commission services that people would potentially interact with at those different stages. So I think that was to try and help, but we do take your point, Bond, but unless you want to come back on that. Um, you want to come back on, yeah, go ahead, um, Sarah. Yeah, please, quick quick supplementary, I guess, point. I appreciate it's, it's not demonstrating the life cycle and how you integrate care throughout that life cycle that I had a problem with. It's that there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing in it. I mean, to say we want somebody to be well is meaningless. To say we want to give everyone access to nutritious food is actually fairly meaningless. You know, the, the converse is we want everyone to go to McDonald's and eat terribly. I mean, it's, we would take that as red. And, and, you know, to get people the best start in life. Well, clearly we all want that. It, it doesn't mean anything. And something with a bit more substance through the life cycle 
would have meant something. But so I did put a lot of effort into trying to read the report twice. That's what I will say. Um, and I, I did. I'm sorry to say this because, you know, clearly you're, you know, highly qualified people working in a very demanding environment, and I completely understand that. But I just, uh, I, I was, I just found it very dissatisfying. Thank you, but appreciated the answers because they, you know, then the information comes out. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think. Um, we're still taking questions from the panel. Um, yes, Councillor Matt Morrow. Thank Councilor you, Chair. Matt Morrow, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I understand what you mean by assistive technology, but could you give me a, a, a practical example of something that has been rolled out or is about to be rolled out and, and how people are using it? Thank you. Really good question, and I think um, Councillor Lollivar sent a note to councillors recently to, to talk about, you know, what are the sorts of things that we can do to showcase some of this, to bring it to life, because the language, again, is kind of high level and you don't understand always what that means. The sorts of devices that we're talking about are things like an example of what we already use, something called just checking. So they can be like sensors and devices in the home that can check whether people might have fallen or they need some assistance, they might have wandered out of their doors, those sorts of things, so that we can know when to respond to some data that shows us some um, worrying things that might be happening in somebody's home, always with consent when they receive these devices, and then to respond to that need, so to intervene a bit earlier. So we, what we find at the moment is some people have falls and then we're going into the home and then we're supporting them and they might end up in hospital some of these um, devices are meant to prevent some of that and be proactive and support people earlier. Um, another example might be um, things like watches to um, understand people's different vital signs and understanding what that means for them as an individual. And then some other things like tablets in the home so that people can do interactive um, speaking. In the pandemic, they became a real feature of assistive technology, particularly with social isolation and the workforce being constrained in terms of being able to go out into communities. So some of them are kind of similar to the Amazon sort of devices that you see in day-to-day -day life, but they're kind of um, programmed in a different way so that they pick up on health and care needs. Um, this service that we're commissioning, we think is the, from our knowledge at the moment, the only integrated one in the country from day one. So again, putting the person at the centre, people if they've got a health need or a social care need would re receive different devices depending on the assessment, really person-centred assessment about what they need and, and the things that they need in their lives. And they can be used outside the home as well. It's not about um, being fixed devices in the home. So it's to enable people to be in the community as well. But we're more than happy to showcase in kind of real life some of those devices and bring back um, Kit Collingwood, who I'm sure you know um, as the digital lead in the borough and I are working on this jointly and we'd be delighted to come back and show, you know, in time after it goes live in January, some real kind of case studies of the impact. And we've also got some of that in our discovery report as well about um, learning from elsewhere um, where this stuff is already in place. Does that help? Thank you. Thank you for the answer, the question and the answer as well. Any further questions? Um, Councillor Tester, you have any question? Go ahead. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, and thanks again for the report. Um, uh, very, really in depth. Um, it's just a kind of more of a follow up on what Councillor Merrill was just saying. As, as she said, reading through it, a lot of it doesn't really make sense or doesn't really say a lot. Um, what, what I feel um, is slightly missing in here is, is some of the results of some of this, because obviously, as you just mentioned, it's a, a three year journey, a new vision, you're, you're, you're building this up, and, and obviously, it's been going for a while. Has any of it started to work and, you know, can you give us any more information on the progress of this new vision? Please. Thank you. Go ahead, Tim. So a really good example is some of the mental health vision work that I spoke about. So when I came into Greenwich three years ago, we were kind of engaging with residents, but not in a really deep way. So um, what we wanted to do was build the capability and the skills in our teams to do that. So we now have specific officers who have got lived experience that are actually council officers who are going out and doing that work in our communities. And in that mental health vision work, 
That's built up the range of people that we're now working with. One of the specific things that they were doing was to design um, the next steps to recommission our supported living um, mental health provision. And what we've come out of with that is really solid things from our residents that are now being built into continuous improvement processes. So now, today, I can say that the, the feedback we've had from residents, our voluntary sector providers that provide supported living, have sat literally side by side with those residents and said, what do you understand to be these good supported living services? We're not waiting until they're recommissioned to make those improvements. We're doing that along the journey. So I think some of that evidence would be worth bringing back because then it's not so high level. It's about some specific things in the report. Whilst this was about a kind of three year journey, some things have happened along the way that we can bring back, um, maybe in some um, stories about people. And, wouldn't it be lovely if we had some of our residents come and talk about the work that we've been doing with them because they tell me it's very different, the re relationship that we have. You know, some of the best days of my life in work are when I'm sat in a community centre like I was, you know, in the mental health vision work with our previous um, cabinet member and we were doing an exercise about getting to know each other. We were throwing a ball of string across the room and whoever caught that, had to say something about them as a person and what they enjoyed in life. We were all in that room together, whether we were residents or officers or people from the voluntary sector working in services or from the NHS or social workers. And it was beautiful. That's what I come here to do, is to be out with our residents. So that journey of actually us being out in the community and not just... We've never, as commissioners, been sat behind desks. That's never been the sort of thing that my teams have wanted to do because that's not what they come to work to do. But we're doing more of it. And if we don't understand what our residents think they need in terms of the design of these sorts of things in communities, then we can't hold our hands up and say we've given them um, the best that we can. Yeah, thank you, um, Councillor Tester, for your question and then the answers that we're giving. Uh, you want to come in, um, Councillor Oliver, go I ahead. Yeah, I just want to say one thing. I, I think I'm, I'm, there's a frustration that I think the, te the work that Lisa's team is doing is really f amazing. And I, and I guess I'm frustrated, and I apologize myself, but I feel that, you know, that we've not shown it as well as we could. Like, the journey that the team have gone on has really changed the way that we're working in Greenwich. I think you came in, it was changed around in 2022. COVID hit, yeah, so Lisa has been hidden away, I think, somewhat, and transforming a team that, as she says, was originally kind of viewed and potentially even working to some extent as uh, just commissioning here, uh, contracting a service here and there. The way the team is working now is so much more strategic, so much more visionary and really joined up, joined up not only with our NHS colleagues um, and across the health service, but also across the whole of Greenwich as well. You know, seeing things like the ATEC example, that is collaborative work with uh, our, you know, our tech team to, as Lisa said, introduce a service that we consider to be the first in fully integrated service that we, that a council has ever undertaken. So um, that the work that is going on in that team is is truly impressive. And and you know, I think what we can do is when we send that those follow up slides, and hopefully when you've had time to look through it, you can really see that because I think. Um, I don't think that we have seen, I guess the way I can maybe express it is, we as members will have casework, we'll see residents coming to us with you know, really complex issues that are coming up again and again. I think what I've definitely seen from Lisa and the team is they are doing that horizon scanning. Um, not only are they keeping an eye on providers, you know, ones to, to counselor, um, Olubemi has pointed out um, some that we're concerned about. Keep making sure that our residents are safe, constantly, proactively, quality checking a, an, an industry which is somewhat out of our control, but doing everything the best they can. And I think the other element as well is um, um, contracting new services, reimagining what they will look like. And I don't think we've had that strategic vision here before. And I think that that is what has changed in since I think the team that Lisa has built is, is actually going out and speaking to people, um, 
taking that vision from individuals and from what I guess we collect from, from members and being like, what is the mental health service that people need and designing it. And I think, I think that is the big change here that, um, um, that you know, I want, I guess, to get across to, to members tonight. Uh, thanks, um, Councillor Lolva, for um, the further um, clarification and more or less making things um, how you, we work within the borough. Um, yes, we have Councillor Merrill still wants to ask a question. So thank you for that, Councillor Lolliver. Yeah, I, so I, I, I take that and um, I guess uh, and that, that will be really good to hear. And I don't know how else to put it, but but like I believe you, but yeah, I don't feel that was reflected in the report. And perhaps just some straightforward examples just to demonstrate where change has happened. Actually, something much simpler from, from my empty head would have been would have been much better. So I'm, I'm sure that's happened and it's very, very good to hear, genuinely. So um, thank you. Yeah, um, yes. Did you want to say something as well? Oh, respond first and then go ahead, um, Lisa. No, I really appreciate it. It's, it's a complex uh, set of things to try and simplify. And sometimes uh, doing that, you, you don't get it right, which is absolutely good feedback for us. I think um, some of the other services that I have that I know members are really uh, interested in often are things like direct payment services, so where people have that sort of support to manage their own care and support. So I also mentioned those in the report. I kind of didn't. Uh, in the presentation part, but that again has been from feedback with residents, and I know those are things that come across casework as well. So I thought it was an important thing to say that some of my teams are much more strategic than others. Some are actually quite operational in that kind of day to day work, things like the financial protection appointeeship team, public funerals. One of my team has had uh, um, seven compliments this year for the work that she does with families who need us to arrange their funerals when they sadly die with n nobody to do that. That sort of thing makes such a difference to our residents' lives. So maybe some of those sorts of things as well might be worth bringing back um, so that you can see those sorts of case studies for the future. Thank you. Councillor Tester. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Councillor Oliver. Um, did, did I hear right that you said um, Greenwich was one of the first councils to have done this kind of approach. Is, um, sorry? It was just uh, on assistive technology, not the first ever, but the first, we believe, to have a fully integrated approach, which means that the council and the health service are working hand in hand. And again, we I think another point just to make, sorry, while well, I've got the mic, um, I think we... Again, we should be incredibly proud of our integrated services here in, in Greenwich. When I speak to people in, across you know, the UK, not everyone has that set up. We're, it's something that officers have worked very hard to build on both sides, and we're reaping the benefits of it. And the Integrated Commissioning Leases team is part of that. We're building on really strong foundations, which not all councils maybe have. So we, we, we as it stands, we will, as, unless anyone launches really soon, <laughs> we believe um, when this launches in March 2025 or 2025, I'll say 2025, um, it will be the first fully integrated. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Another further question? Um, so thank you for your questions and also for the answers. I just wanted to um, quickly mention, um, <clears throat> I think this is about continuing care. You did speak about continuing care. I'll come to you, that's fine. Um, we know that the NHS, when we got integrated um, adult care and health, um, and especially when COVID got in, um, people were encouraged to be discharged home. They call it D to a discharge to assess at home rather than stay in the hospital, which was actually blocking beds and making the NM, the A and E's to be, you know, not being able to move because people are blocking beds and the rest. I just want you to possibly comment on how that has worked since you came um, on the continuing care part of it, um, because definitely um, these are people who have very intense conditions. Their conditions are unpredictable. The, the nature of their conditions can be chronic, 
and there is um, also um, complexity about their conditions as well. So how has that worked in our borough here is the first question. The second part also is um, um, we spoke about living um, wages, for instance. Um, we know that the NHS um, and that of social care, a lot of um, care providers are really, really struggling. Some are leaving the borough or London because they are not able to cope to pay rents and their mortgages, and, and these are really serious matters. Um, I know you've mentioned that you're paying um, some cases above the, the, the national average. Um, I just want to, you to comment on what is the situation about the workforce within our borough here, and to also make a recommendation that um, um, in order to retain staff, sometimes it's not just how much you pay them, but also how much you appreciate them and also to um, you know, acknowledge their presence. We have a system in, in inner London, especially guys and St. Thomas's, when you work for up to five years, we bring you to um, the, the, the front line to say, thank you for working with us for five years. If it is 10 years, you get a certificate, you get a medal to put around. These are things that people appreciate so much. They'll put it on their living rooms and the rest. And being the mayor for this place the last um, term, I have seen that um, the last um, um, long-term service we did were people who served up to 40 and 45 years. Um, if we are not already doing people starting from 5, 10, 15, and 20, please let's start doing that because it helps in retention. That was just um, a kind of suggestion. And then, um, yeah, so if you can comment on that, please. Thank you. So starting with continuing care uh, for children, continuing care for t continuing health care for adults, it's obviously a, a, an important thing that we join up on as well. Um, so out of the uh, pandemic, we saw there was a change in the flow of funding and also the way that people were discharged into continuing care. So more people went straight into continuing care and then had to be reviewed and then uh, reassessed for whether they were eligible or not. That meant that the kind of policies and procedures changed for a short amount of time during the pandemic. And then we had to reset those when the national uh, continuing health, health care framework was refreshed in 2022. What we then had to do was work with our adult social care colleagues, our colleagues in the hospitals and community um, trusts in health for them to understand that shift again back to the, the kind of standards in that framework. So we've done a lot of work um, and actually recently Nick Davies and I have been running workshops between our teams in adult social care and other parts of um, Greenwich in terms of the workforce and our continuing healthcare team so people can really understand the way that we should be discharging to assess, like you say, making sure people are settled in the community before their long-term needs are assessed. So I think it is working better and as I said to you, that trend over time in terms of the performance of the team. One of the things that we uh, are measured on is the 28-day assessment um, target, and we've consistently met that at 100% over the um, last year. What that indicates to me is that our workforce, our nurses are going out and supporting those people, as you say, that have got complex needs and you know different disabilities and needs over time. We also work with the Greenwich um, Community Hospice on continuing health care. So if people have um, needs that look like they're turning into end of life needs, um, we're able to fast track people and get their support so that they're not stuck in hospital. They can hopefully go home or wherever their home is and die where they wish with that support um, from continuing healthcare fast track funding. And then we also have people who want more choice. So we have direct payments for people uh, known as personal health budgets. And my internal team that I mentioned earlier on support people with adult social care direct payments or health direct payments or children. So again, a bit of a joined up way of um, improving those continuing healthcare services. And then in terms of the price side of it and providers and the quality side, we're also making sure that our teams support people um, to get the best quality provision who are on continuing healthcare as well. So there's been, there's been a lot of improvement and I'm really proud of that team over the last year. And as I said, those um, performance reports, we could come back and speak about if um, the panel were interested at a later time. In terms of workforce, um, 
you make a really good point about London living wage as well, I think, in terms of the difference of um, living costs in London compared to elsewhere. So we're increasingly trying to build those um, requirements in to pay at a higher rate, but obviously we need to be able to afford that as well. So the local authority is balancing up that affordability and the funding that we get to pass on into those wages and making sure that they go to the providers that will pass them on. And like you said, recognition is really important. So I've been in um, different authorities where there are things like care awards. I'd love to see that here. We've had that feedback from our providers. We had some additional money over the last couple of years um, known as the Market Sustainability Improvement Fund. What we did with some of that was actually pass that directly to providers to reward people with additional bonuses and things like that. That was monetary, but it was on, in addition to their normal pay. And actually the reward side of that and the feedback that we got was really lovely because it was people saying that that just gave me the sense that I'm actually as important as other workers like NHS uh, or other um, who sometimes people think they're paid more than our care workforce. And in some cases there are, there are those um, disparities, so we're trying to address that. But those sorts of care awards and things like that, we're, we're running different forums and networks with our providers and the workforce to get their ideas about what they want, and then we'll facilitate trying to put some of that in place. So the likes of you as mayor or, or others would hopefully in future be able to also speak to our um, actual care workers and, and we can then reward them through those um, conversations we have with them as well. Thank you. Um, before I make my final remark, I think um, we've got a question from... Hello, if you can mention your name and then ask your questions, I think you can come and use one of the... Yes, you can come and use one of that, yes. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Muncy. Um, I'm here tonight to advocate on behalf of the source, which is at 65 Sibthorpe Road, Horn Park, SE12. And um, I've also just completed a master's degree at University College London in Creative Health. I'm well able to speak the high level vocabulary that's being used. Um, the problem here is a lot of this um, is based on World Health Organization. The, the, um, a, a, this diagram on page 55 of the report, it's based on World Health Organization values and principles, not on NHS values and principles. And there's a bit of a conflict. The two frames don't exactly match up. So um, the, the ladies de delivered a report about how it might look at a community level, at a neighborhood level. And we have a, a service called The Source at 65 Sibthorpe Road. Um, there are two three-hour sessions per week delivered by nurse practitioners, a Charlton Athletic Community Trust are delivering a wellbeing service. Um, they're doing the social prescribing aspect and the nurse practitioners are doing the make every contact count aspect. And then there's also a sexual health service. The original service model was a full-time model, five days a week, and we have fought and fought and fought to get that re-established, but it's not happening. So um, the question is, uh, why is the Oxley's contract not set up to provide clinical service provision to people under 18? And the response that's come back a number of times from the integrated care board team is that the nurse practitioners don't have sufficient registrations to see that age cohort, which is actually inaccurate because one of them is qualified to do that. It's more to do with the Oxley's contracts structure to do with clinical risk insurance and stuff like that. Cannot get a transparent answer about that. So we're about to move into an extremely difficult winter there are huge benefit changes going ahead. A lot of people are being moved onto universal credit or won't be eligible to move from legacy benefits onto universal credit. There's um, problems for people like me who are permanently crippled. I now live in Woolwich. I'm registered with Triveni PMS, which means that I'm permitted to use the source. It's anybody registered with a Greenwich GP. And um, I am unable to get an appointment with my GP practice on a telephone in the morning. When I use the online web form, um, most recently I had to wait five days to get a response from my GP to ring back. 
and I'm actually quite seriously unwell. I'm just seeing the cardiologist up at the Queen Elizabeth now. It's, I'm quite young to be like this. And it's just unfortunate that for people like me, life is incredibly hard right now. So it's um, very frustrated to hear that all this report and no mention of the fact that there's already a service available in the community and it's not being properly used. It's not a talking to the start well aspect. It's not talking to the be well aspect or the feel well aspect. So it's, it's just so frustrating. And that's why I'm asking tonight to bring it back to the attention of the panel because we came in February to talk about this quite extensively and we were expecting the integrated care board team to respond tonight and it's not on the agenda at all. Okay, um, your, your first name is Elizabeth, is that right? Yes, my name's Elizabeth Muncy. Yeah, um, Muncy. We've also been to Horn Park Primary School quite a bit. They are desperate to get their parents and carers of young people okay. over to the source to see the nurse practitioner in a timely fashion. It stops people who are on these um, short-term job contracts losing time at work. It's stopping yeah. people becoming iller than they need to be. So yeah. it's very frustrating. Yeah, thanks for your, your question. I will ask them, um, I will, yeah, okay, I will ask them, um, Councillor, Lolvatu to speak before um, Lisa. Yeah, it was just it was just one point on the on the report specifically. So um, on we have kind of clear kind of guidelines on on when the reports get commissioned about what the focus is. I just wanted to provide reassurance that there is a neighbourhood report or neighbourhood planned report. I think it's due in January next year. It's which, next year, yeah. We're next year, it's which will be one, looking yeah. at all of the neighbourhood work that's taking place within Greenwich, which includes the Horn Park work. So that will be covered in that report. I just wanted to make that point clear, and then I'll let Lisa go into the detail. Yeah, Lisa, you can respond. Thank you. Thank you. I've had some communication with some colleagues today um, and over the week because I wanted to come with um, some responses because I was made aware of your questions, Elizabeth, and I'm sorry to hear that you've had those challenges. Um, the first thing to say is that I understand that the source is being um, slightly amended in terms of the opening hours, so I think your point about the number of hours a week um, are opening uh, now, I think, is due to change, so that that's increased. The other point that you made about Lewisham um, access, that's also being addressed through the leasing arrangements in the building, so that um, the way that the NHS services work at the moment is, as you quite rightly say, you have to be registered with a GP, in Greenwich, but we're making sure that those partnerships work so that people have that wider access with other services coming in to meet um, people's needs that might be coming over from that Lewisham border. So that information has been shared with me and I understand we'll come back um, with some more detail on that. And also your point about the under 18 access, I understand is being addressed as well. Um, the technicalities of that, I'm not qualified to talk about. Obviously, we'd need to um, get a further response about that. But I've received that information, I think, to suggest that the improvements that you're seeking are actually in train in terms of um, the improvements. And we're also looking to improve the environment of that building to make sure there's more consulting rooms and that there's more space. Um, it's obviously in the confidential nature that it's needed, which should also open up the, the ability for those more sessions a week. Um, so I hope that reassures you somewhat and obviously there's more information that we can bring back on that as part of the neighbourhood report as well. Yeah, um, Sarah, you wanted to say something as well? Um, I, 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 yeah, b b before the resident comes back. Um, so I have lived this um, experience of the source for the past few years as well and clearly I know Roger quite well and I know that the Member of Parliament Clive Efford of course has been very involved in this and this has always run in co complete odds with all the aspirations that have come before us as a council and, and, and to this committee so um, I, I don't really have anything to add to that to, but to say that I do completely concur with everything that Elizabeth has said because it is something that I know was a huge, it has been a huge campaign for a long time. And um, it's not helpful to say this at this point, but I will just add, we could never understand over there in the Eltham part of the borough, why this was ever, ever taken out of service in the first place. It was the strangest thing because it was so valuable. The Member of Parliament always said it was because it, you know, it cost too much because the health needs of people who 
had very low incomes, and they, there was, this is what the Member of Parliament said, and they wanted doctor surgeries, etc., wanted to move them, move to sort of wealthier areas where they, that, that would, quite frankly, be less expensive. That's a line that's been used quite a lot, quite a lot I know. So you're right, everything that happens around the source is completely at odds with all the aspirations, certainly in what I read tonight and, um, and what comes forward. That's not directed at you, Lisa, directly, um, but it is just very true. And then after all that campaigning, it only came back for, like, how many hours a week? Did you... Um, this is definitely going to be... Yeah, go, go ahead. Um, part of the email that I sent earlier in the meet, week was that the nurse practitioners are still working off of a modem Wi-Fi hotspot because the internet connection is so unstable. It wasn't about public access or guest access. It was about the fact that the nurse practitioners have no stable internet connection while they're running the clinical services. They're actually having to use mobile Wi-Fi hotspots. So that's, that's okay. Yeah, Lisa, you want to? And um, second comeback was, unfortunately, Mr. Gartland is still grieving the death of his wife, and I'm still grieving the death of my mother, and we haven't been as active in the last few months as we should have been, because we're just saying we are here. It's a fantastic little service model. If it could be rolled out in the rest of the borough, it would be so helpful, particularly with what's coming up this winter, not just with the pensioners, but with everybody who's being moved off of um, income-based benefits onto universal credit. I'm finding that they're no longer eligible or they've missed the deadline for applying. People are going to be starving, literally starving. It's really frightening. Yeah, um, Lisa, you can. So one of part of the response that I had today was about the internet connectivity as well, and as part of those um, improvements to the building, that is being addressed so that, quite rightly, as you say, the staff in there can have the access that they need. Um, so I can assure you that that is part of that plan um, and uh, you know any of that feedback once it's um, in place those improvements we'd obviously want to make sure that we get the feedback from residents about the impact that it's having and um, hopefully more positively than it, uh, it has been. And, has and been I'd just like now. to say a massive thank you to Kellyanne Abraham from the council who's successfully set up um, a Horn Park residence group in the last few months and They've already managed to successfully get one pot of funding. Now that we've got a residence committee, we're probably going to be able to get a bigger pot of funding because we literally don't have um, a community meeting space on the estate anymore. But that's separate from the source. Thank you. Um, and I think your question was very helpful. These are the practicalities of the day we're talking about, things that are happening. Um, and of course, you will get um, a further detailed answer on the next... Um, panel because um, that will be on the 23rd of January where we'll be discussing also neighborhood health plans. So we will make sure that that is um, uh, inculcated there so that you will have the answers there as well. But I will swiftly go back to um, um, item number six which was um, just to conclude um, that uh, um, to thank you Lisa for um, the, the, the report um, or did you want to say something before? Go ahead. I didn't Thank see you, Chair. Yes, that's why I had to raise my hand up all the way up. Lisa, if you could just consider as well the under 18. I don't know if you captured that. Why, um, especially if the practitioner there is licensed to work with under 18, that would be very helpful as well, please. Especially, you know, when you think of the question I asked earlier about young people and mental health and data. So this is something we need to look into. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa, go ahead, yes. Yeah, the under-18 issue is being looked into. I think there was a, an, an issue about the registration that was talked about um, by Elizabeth. Um, I think it's um, from this response that I got that um, service delivery for children and young people are, is part of the improvements that are underway. Yeah, so um, I was just um, thanking you for the report and also the answers you've given to panel members. Um, definitely, um, we've heard from... Councillor Olubemi um, regarding the supported living, contract monitoring, and workforce. Um, those comments are things you possibly have to look at. Um, definitely also the, 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 the report has a lot of information, 
But I, as um, panel members have mentioned, if it is made simpler and also um, uh, uh, more or less in a bullet form or with examples and evidences that you have, the, with the journey that you've spoken about, it will be very helpful, these are, um, subsequent ones. And of course, you did give good examples of um, the assisted technology. This is something that, as you have mentioned, um, I happen to work um, in, in that area where we deal with people when they leave hospital to go home. And I think that this is one area that is saving the NHS a lot of money and also making people independent in their own homes, which is really something that um, um, we have to be proud of what you have um, done about that. Um, of course, um, Councillor Tester did speak about um, the results as well. Um, results. The journey, there were a lot of things that have happened. Um, our, our, uh, Elizabeth was just giving us the good examples of things that have worked well and why it should be rolled over. These are the evidences and the results that needs to be captured um, in future reports. And, and also to just sum up to say thank you for coming to answer all these questions, but then we want to make sure that um, if there are follow-ups, we will want to see these evidences so that um, uh, members, and sometimes, as you rightly put it, if there was a, if there was a resident here who has benefited any of these, it is a, they, they, in the form of a case study or, or someone who has benefited it that will get up to say, this is exactly what we're talking about. And that will normally be helpful to panel members, I, I, I think, from what we've been hearing this evening. So thanks again for what you've done, and thank you for Elizabeth for your question as well. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, okay. That, that is noted as well. Thank you very much. Um, so thanks um, for, for that. Um, I think you have, um, you have finished your, 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 your agenda or your topic tonight, and thank you for coming. And um, Councillor Lolliver, thank you also for supporting and, um, um, and, and, and coming to also um, support um, the director for what um, we are doing or what you are doing in the borough. Um, I think we have already dealt with um, item seven. So item eight will be the commissioning future reports. Um, when we had the pre-meeting, um, the next meeting is supposed to be on the 23rd of January 2022. Um, when we met the last time, we did um, suggest uh, some few items, about four items, which were all captured. Um, the only one that has not been captured has been the ICB, the financial aspect of it. So um, the next agenda, we have two. Luckily, we have two agendas. And we want to make sure that um, um, I think panel members unanimously agree that we would like to hear from ICB regarding how health uh, money is being spent. And, and I think that that was what we agreed, isn't it? So on the 23rd, that's what we will, I will be um, communicating with the directors to see how best the scope can be um, captured. Um, and I believe um, if McMurray wouldn't mind, you can just send into detail the area of um, concern if you pass it on to um, our brother Nasir here, our officer, he will be able to pass it on to the directors and it will get to ICB so that they will hit on what we want to hear so that we can ask the relevant questions. Um, did somebody raise their hand? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you for explaining that and that's, that's a really helpful um, way forward. Uh, so just to be explicit, the proportion of the overall spend on health that goes to mental health has gone down this year, as it has done many times. And what I'm proposing, and as I understand it, what we're, what we're agreeing to do, is that um, the people who set that budget um, should, should come here and talk to us about um, why they've made those decisions um, and presumably what the consequences of those decisions are and, and what might happen in the future. Thank you, Chair. You are very clear on that, isn't it? So yes, that, that is taken. Um, in the absence of any other thing, I will say thank you for coming and have a blessed evening. Thank you.